Okay, so I'm on the line with Dr. Bill Deagle. This is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and today is uh, July 18th, Saturday, uh, 2009. So, Bill, what we should do here is just uh, record this call, um, not that we would publish it unless we decide that, you know, you decide you want it published and I decide I want it published and we agree. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, this, there's some basic things that we can talk about, but it might be best to have the whole panel on. Right. That's what I would yeah. I would really like to do. I'd like to plan this, but it will help if I have a recording. Then Bill, you know, my partner, Bill Ryan, uh, is in Europe. I'm about to join him. I'm flying out on Monday morning very early. Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to Europe. We're, we're going to Barcelona. I'm meeting him in Barcelona. Um, and so we can do it from there, actually. Uh, and I, I just wanted you to list the people that you thought should be involved in the panel. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the first person I would recommend would be Dr. Truot, uh, N.D. Ph.D. Dr. Tru, T-R-U-E, Ot, O-T-T. Uh, second would be uh, Alexander S. Jones. He's an NIH whistleblower, a computer technologist, and viral expert. Dr. Alexander S. Jones. Alex Studer, uh, who runs uh, Zero to Hero Productions. He's a jurisdictionary chapter uh, head uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, uh, Dr. <clears throat> I'd also like to, to have uh, Dr. Mayor Eisenstein. He's an MDJD. Uh, Mayor is a director of a number of wellness clinics in the Illinois, Chicago area, and also a JD. He's written the book, uh, Don't Vaccinate Before You Educate. Um, and I think that would be enough to cover all the bases of the areas that are involved. If I can get also Dr. Russell Blaylock, he's a neurosurgeon oh, yes. at CCN. Dr. Blaylock, of course, has done some recent reviews, uh, as I have, of the edge of and components that are in this uh, proposed vaccines that they're going to have as mandatory vaccines this fall. And he's equally disturbed by what they're planning to do in terms of lack of testing and release of them. So that would kind of round out the panel. It depends on if we can get all of those or a number of those because um, sometimes people won't necessarily believe the uh, words of one person, but when you have a panel of experts that are they don't have it rehearsed and just to, are answering questions or carrying out a dialogue, it may be more convincing to those people who otherwise may not make a decision. I think that's a great idea. Um, what you, what I'd ask you to do is you, if you have email addresses for all of those people and or, or phone numbers, if you could forward all that information to us. Yeah, I can probably just send it through a Skype that way if you're... Okay. Uh, that would be that way, or I can actually just send it to your email. What's your email address, uh, Carrie? Uh, well, it's it's carry at projectcamelot.org or support at projectcamelot.org. Uh, either one will work, but um, my first name is K-E-R-R-Y. Yeah. And uh, so uh, okay. it's just projectcamelot.org. <clears throat> I can give a couple of, kind of a couple of minute summary of what we have so far. Okay. Uh, because we're tracking uh, not only the things that are in the public domain that are, you know, published articles by everything from Reuters and AP Newswire, but we have journalists that are on the ground. One of them we had on yesterday was Alexander Bachman. He might be another person on the panel that would be worthwhile. He speaks seven languages and is an English teacher and professor in Mexico. <clears throat> he's actually of Swiss uh, descent, but he's a Mexican full citizen. And he's been researching, and we've been on a number of programs, including... Um, Victor Hamacho's uh, radio show out of Los Angeles regularly, and he's translated into Hispanic, which we broadcast across most of the Hispanic uh, major cities in, in uh, Mexico, Central, and South America over the last few months. And we're planning on doing another show on Tuesday, which is the 21st broadcast as well, probably for a couple of hours. Uh, there is an outbreak in Chiapas province and the Yucatan of a more lethal substrain of this H1N1 flu. There's also some very strange characteristics of the flu showing up, uh, including analysis by Dr. Henry L. Nyman at Recombinomics.com that shows that 90% of the genetics are tracking along virtually identical with the emergence of the 1918 flu with the first wave being a herald, H-E-R-A-L-D wave, according to Dr. Gleason, G-L-E-Z-E-N, at the Baylor College of Medicine Houston Viral Research Center. 
and the second and third waves becoming more lethal by a whole series of now very well established published research that the virus will almost certainly emerge being more lethal. Now it doesn't need to be a lot more lethal. Right now it's probably less than half a percent unless you have somebody with a high body mass index or asthma or certain certain patients, whether you're young or otherwise have no problems, uh, it becomes quite lethal. But the virus is <clears throat> probably going to rise this fall and winter in one or more ways on its own without any help from uh, the mandatory vaccine programs and the use of toxic and dangerous drugs like Tamiflu um, to a 25 to 5% lethality rate. Now, the amount of infectivity is this virus is actually spreading faster and multiplying quicker in the population by six times than any other flu that has ever affected humanity. Um, luckily, for most people, it's relatively mild, but it's going to get far more genetics. And it's already, we've tracked a couple of gene changes on the <clears throat> H gene and on the E gene. And what's happened is that it's now growing at a lower temperature. It's acquired, in many cases, Tamiflu resistance. And it's acquired new gene changes so that it can replicate quicker in the body as well. Those changes have already been published as PCR, so I'm just talking about what's in the public domain. The virus, we did a genetic analysis of it, <clears throat> and 6 to 8% of the viral DNA does not match up with any known viral uh, databases. And we did what's called a BLAST analysis of the genetic codons, and that was primarily done by Alexander S. Jones and a team of some of his friends in virology. And the analysis shows that the virus was put together in a laboratory that is a triple-triple recombinant that could not have been anything other than created in a laboratory as a biological, in a sense, weapon. So this is a, a an engineered virus <clears throat> with genes from four different sources of flu from three different continents that suddenly emerged just outside the Baxter facility south of Mexico City, ground zero. It's um, almost certainly what's called a bridge virus, which means over time it will not only acquire new genetics to become slightly more lethal, but it also is almost certainly now it's getting embedding into populations in, such as in Asia, where it's going to recombine in the next uh, number of months into a new recombinant that contains the more lethal genes in H5N1, the so-called avian flu. And when that happens, it's really going to become a very big problem. It's going to become serious already fairly quickly, as early as the next few weeks to months, uh, but it also can become much, much more serious. So uh, this is, of course, parallel with the changes in the world economic system. Um, one of the moves that was being touted for some months was the collapse of the U.S. dollar, but that can't happen because 64% of the reserve currencies of all the nations in the world are in dollars, and that's equivalent to somewhere around $500 trillion in reserve currencies, and if you even took a basket of all the other reserve currencies of the major 10 nations they're talking about, none of them would even come up to a very tiny, more than a tiny percentage of the total reserve in U.S. dollars. So they can't do that. So the recent uh, deal, and I have this from my sources, between China and America that was just uh, finalized in the last week was to transfer military and high technology to China and Russia so they would agree to not continue to try to call for a new world reserve currency, which, of course, would by itself trash the world economy. So China, of course, being good businessmen and chess players, and Russia have decided to accept transfers of technology, which includes military, strategic, and advanced computing and other biotechnologies um, in exchange for now buying a lot more uh, of the T-bills, etc. So in other words, they put their finger in the dike and it's not going to explode. The thing that's going to be most disturbing is the fact that the uh, waves of this pandemic will start to cause much more erosion and, and damage to the world economy, especially with international transport uh, flights, quarantine, and of course the danger of medical martial law occurring this fall and winter.